Toronto, aka Hogtown, Money York, the Big Smoke, now leads all North American municipalities in large scale development. We're big and we're getting bigger. We're over 6.5 million people in the GTA right now, with another 3 million projected to move in by 2036. Hello there! All of us together bring diversity, great food, more culture, lots of color, and bad congestion. Yes, congestion. Traffic jams, clogged sidewalks, mindless commutes, jam-packed subway systems. Congestion is more than a nuisance. It's more than a pain in the ear. It's a drain on our prosperity and our quality of life. You know, it wasn't always like this. At the beginning of the last century, we were called Toronto the Good for good reason. We led the way in spending on infrastructure and transit, and we thought ahead. In 1918, we built the Bloor Viaduct with an undercarriage that could carry the future subway. We were planning 50 years ahead. We built 78 new streetcar routes in the early 1920s. And in 54, we became one of the smallest cities in the world to ever build a subway, which we expanded regularly until the 1980s. Then, a screeching halt. Investment in transit virtually froze in the 1980s. That's pretty much a full generation where our transportation investments didn't keep up with our city's population or economic growth. Traffic grew. Access seemed to shrink. Public transit was getting overwhelmed. For the past 30 years, we've been overburdening the transportation system of a generation ago. Now, we're all feeling congested. Now, this is a really big deal. The social and economic costs of congestion have been estimated at $6 billion annually. In 25 years, more than double that. $15 billion annually. That's from wasted fuel, carbon emissions, a slow movement of goods and deliveries, and travel delays, all resulting in lost productivity. Traffic is a serious quality of life issue in our city. In 2010, the average trip to work was 33 minutes. Today, 27% of Toronto commuters spend more than 45 minutes traveling each way to work. That's nearly a work day a week, just to get to and from work. Now, we're finally reinvesting in transit over $12 billion on projects like the Air Rail Link, the Union Station Revitalization, or the Spadina Subway Extension New York Region, and 52 kilometers of light rail lines on Eglinton, Finch, Shepherd to replace the Scarborough RT. But comparatively speaking, we're still feeling congested because we still have to overcome those decades where transit development didn't keep pace with our explosive growth. Working on a fix for this is going to benefit all of us. Drivers, transit users, cyclists, pedestrians, residents of the city, and importantly businesses. It will help the city function better. It will boost our prosperity by ensuring Toronto remains a place where businesses want to invest. To remain competitive, to become a world-class city, we need to appeal to young, skilled workers who are demanding better transit and better streets for both walking and cycling. And when you look at examples from around the world, cities like LA, Washington DC, Madrid, Paris, they're all paying attention to what future generations want and are investing in what it takes to stay attractive and relevant in the 21st century. We need to make plans. We've done that. We need to think broadly. We're doing that. We need to make streets complete for everyone. We want that. We need a way to pay for it all. We're considering that, and you should too. Hear what we're proposing. Tell us what you're thinking at feelingcongested.ca. Toronto is your city. Toronto is my city. Let's build it together. Welcome. It's absolutely fabulous to have you here this evening for a conversation about transportation planning here in the City of Toronto. We decided to start with that video. We made that video because we realized all of our conversations don't mean anything if we don't all buy into the why this matters. 
So that's a bit of the why. That video is on the website. I uh, would encourage you to share it. I suspect that you are in the room here today because you buy into all of that. You know all of that. That this is a topic that matters profoundly to our city. Our discussion panel this evening is a part of the overall feeling congested process. And in this process, we're having a conversation about how we make sound transportation planning decisions. Now I know that sounds a little dry, it sounds a little boring, sound transportation decisions. But part of what we wanted to do is to connect very clearly the way we plan for transportation with the city we get. This is about nothing less than creating a great city. We're going to have a panel discussion. I'm going to provide a little bit of an introduction to some of the thoughts and ideas that are informing this process moving forward. And we're going to have an opportunity for you to ask questions from the floor, to talk to our panelists, to ask us questions in order to shape the discussion. In this process, we are preparing policies that we're going to be recommending to Council in November. And part of what we wanted to do was to come to the public with these policies, with this approach to transportation planning, to ask whether it makes sense. So what I'm going to do in the introduction here in this presentation is just walk through some of the thinking that you'll see in that toolkit that was handed to you as you walked into the room today. We're going to show you some of that thinking, unfold some of it, to be the basis of the conversation that we're going to have here today. Toronto has a transportation vision, and this is contained in our official plan, which is the regulatory document that shapes this city. And there's really four key ideas in that official plan. One is about moving people. Transportation is about how we get from point A to, a to B. It's also about moving goods, which is a fundamental part of ensuring that our economy is going to succeed in this city. It's also about moving less planning our city in such a way that we connect together land use planning with transportation in such a place that we make complete communities where we have the option to do a whole variety of things within walking distance, cycling distance, or a short transit ride of home. And how we plan our city has a profound impact on whether or not that becomes a reality. We can look, for example, at when we stopped investing in transit back in the 1980s, it was also a time of explosive suburban growth. We were moving in a very different way, moving in our cars, and at the same time, we were planning our land in a different way. Now we're suffering some of the consequences of that, and as we mature as a city, as we densify as a city, it's imperative that we also mature our thinking about transportation and maturing our thinking, what we've called that in the official plan, is about moving minds, thinking differently about the city that we live in and the place that we live in and how we can improve our policy frameworks, how we can improve our investments such that we continue to build and create a great city. Now, there's a hope we want to hang this thinking on. What you see here on the screen right now, this exists, this framework exists already in our official plan. But there's three key ideas that we'd like to introduce into the official plan moving forward. And these ideas are the bulk of what I'm going to present in this introduction today. And the first idea is really the hook that the other ideas hang on. And it's the idea that we in fact can be a city that has complete streets. We already have policy in the official rec plan around bringing together our uses all mixed up, bringing them in close proximity so that we have complete communities. Well, complete communities need to be supported by complete streets. Streets that aren't simply designed for cars, but streets that are designed for a whole variety of different users so that we have, when we're moving about the city, a whole variety of different choices in terms of how we can move about the city. Sometimes we will in fact drive because it makes the most sense. I had to go out to the Scarborough Civic Centre this morning and it absolutely made sense for me to drive there this morning. But I took the subway down here today. I had a choice. There are different ways we can move about the city if we design our city for that to be a reality. This is about looking at our streets as being a fundamental part of the quality of life that we create in the city. And you see an image here of a complete street. And the idea here is that these are places where you can cycle, where you can walk, 
where you have parking, where you have public spaces and amenity. They're part of the green space system because there is a tree canopy as well. This allows things like active uses at grade. It allows our streets to be active, animated spaces, not just spaces for driving. And in order to achieve this, we need wider sidewalks, we need enhanced crosswalks, we need to ensure that the way all of those different forms of movement, whether you're cycling, taking transit, or driving and parking your car, they end in acting as a pedestrian and moving around as a pedestrian in public space. So all of those considerations become a fundamental part of how we design a complete street. This allows for a critical mass of people to come together in the public realm in a way that actually works. If you have a critical mass of people coming together in their cars, we get much of what we have today, which is significant traffic congestion. The way we plan our city, ensuring that we have active uses at grade, ensuring that our streetscapes are in fact beautiful, ensuring that our buildings come up to the edge of the street is all a very important part of creating complete streets. And we've got some great policies around creating that strong pedestrian realm at grade, but we need more policies around the actual street space. Now you can see here, I'm going to show you a series of examples of what I'm talking about. A complete street doesn't mean that every street looks the same, but it means that streets are planned with a recognition that there are a variety of ways that we move in the city. So I'm just gonna fly through a few different examples. In some of these examples, you'll see that public transit, light rail transit, is the absolute priority. In other examples, you'll see that biking plays a more prominent role. In other places, you'll see that there continues to be a significant right-of-way for the cars, but there is enhanced public realm, a wider sidewalk. And in some instances, we see that the uh, priority of the pedestrian dominates the street in a streetscape. And there are a whole variety of ways that we can plan for cyclists, that we can plan for transit, that we can integrate a whole variety of uses into a complete street. Now, if we're going to plan these complete streets, we need to ensure that we get our transit planning, but also that we begin to think about cycling as being a part of our transportation system. That cycling is worthy of infrastructure, that cycling is a legitimate way to move around. And for those who, uh, who do cycle in the city, you'll know that in some streets in the city, we do an amazing job, and Sherborne is a, an example of our most recent separated cycling facility. There are other streets where you do feel like you don't really belong. And if you're going to cycle from place to place, it's difficult to do so when the network is incomplete. So I'm going to talk a little bit about transit and cycling as being a fundamental part of this vision of creating complete streets. Now, given that transit is a fundamental part of this vision, you'll notice in this package that we've dedicated a lot of pages and a lot of thinking to how we identify transit priorities. And in part, this is because we want to recognize that where we put our transit investments, which are a significant amount of money, needs to link up with a vision of the, lar of the city as a whole. And we also know that we need to make choices, that we can't put the best case scenario ev everywhere, although I do think we need to be much bolder. So what we've done, and you'll see this in the kit, is we've evaluated 24 rapid transit projects. Now, 18 of these projects have been identified by Metrolinx. Some of them are in the uh, next wave, and some of them are beyond the next wave projects identified. And then we also have some City of Toronto identified projects. Some of them are in the official plan already, and some of them are additional projects that have come forward through council recommendations. And part of what we wanted to do was take this list of 24 projects and figure out a good methodology based on completing, com creating complete streets and building a great city, figure out a methodology that would allow us to understand where the investments ought to go, and hence the name of our session, Making Sound Decisions. 
So you can see here, you've got this in your booklet. You can look at it there in detail. You can see that we've kind of mapped out what those 24 projects look like. And there's a logic and a rationale to all of them and an explanation for all of them. And our question was, how do we use data? How do we use an evidence-based approach to figuring out where these investments ought to go? And so we created a technical decision-making framework. And that decision-making framework is based on a series of evaluation criteria. Now, some of you, I'm absolutely com confident, participated in the first round of Feeling Congested, where we talked about revenue tools, and we also talked about these eight criteria. Now, when you take these criteria and you use them as a lens through which to prioritize those 24 projects, different projects rise to the top. So for example, if you decide that supporting growth is a fundamental important criteria for how we plan our transit infrastructure, then you will look at a whole series of measures that we've created that relate to supporting growth, and you can use these measures to identify the impact of various transit lines. And you get certain priorities that emerge as a result, and you can do this and look at this in your toolkit. For example, one of the measures related to supporting growth is looking at the extent to which the line placement serves our employment areas. So the number of employment areas and the number of jobs that are affected by the placement of the line. Now, I'm gonna come right out and tell you what my bias is. Um, I think that all of these criteria, and they're outlined in the flap of your booklet, and they include things like choice, affordability, healthy neighborhoods, social equity. I believe that all of these criteria, and they were largely affirmed in the last round of consultation are essential to building a great city. And we asked people in the last round to rank the criteria and people had a really hard doing it. How do you choose healthy neighborhoods over economic growth? Or how do you choose equity over choice? So we found that in general, there was a very broad support for this framework, which we're now translating and using to prioritize project. So I'm not going to walk through this in detail, but you can see here that you get results. And this is a snapshot of those results. Each one of the letters across the top of the screen represents one of those 24 projects. And you see here the criteria that I had on the previous slide uh, evaluated. And this actually folds out into a much more complex matrix where under each one of these different eight criteria, we've created a series of very specific measures and data. And we've used those in order to create an assessment. And you see that assessment in, in the box as to the extent to which a new line responds to the criteria. So the very first one that you see here, which is identified as A, is the downtown relief line. And you'll notice that the downtown relief line has many complete circles. And in fact, the downtown relief line did rise to the top of one of the key priorities no matter which uh, criteria you used, in almost every instance, it came out very strongly as a priority project. But interesting, Jane Street LRT came out very strongly as well in the top five, frequently, regardless of how you applied the criteria. The Lakeshore LRT as well came out again as a priority in the top 10 almost every single time. These criteria give us a rational, evidence-based way to determine which transit lines are in the best interests of meeting our overall city building objectives. So that's the transit piece. I just have a couple of slides here on the bike policy framework. What we've proposed is that we almost need a new way of thinking about bicycles and bicycle planning in the city. And what we've done is we've identified a network layout that is about looking at the entire city as being an important place for cycling. And we recognize in this approach the detailed vision that exists in the bike plan. And this is about providing an overall organizing structure for how we can approach bicycle policy planning in the future. So this is what it looks like. This is included in your kit as well. It's in one of the booklets. And there's a couple of big ideas here. One is that we've divided the city into two areas. Area one is the area that you see in yellow there, and area two is the area that is really more on the periphery of the more denser urban core of the city. And what we've identified is that in that core area, we already know we have a much higher modal split in terms of cycling. And in that extended area is an area where we want to encourage more cycling. 
we want cycling in all areas. What you see here in the gray lines that look kind of squiggly, those are our bike path systems. So um, following the Humber River, following the DVP, we actually have bike paths that are embedded in our green space system. But the grid that you see, the grid that you see is a proposal for an extensive network where we believe separated cycling facilities are essential to creating a system whereby you can travel on a bike to almost any area of the city. And this is a two kilometer grid where uh, you are in fact from a separated cycling facility anywhere in the entire city with this proposal. It's a bold idea, it's a strong idea that is rooted in a recognition that cycling should be a reasonable choice. And part of the driver for this idea was the commentary that we heard in the last round of consultation where people said to us, you know what, I get it. I cycle on the weekend, I cycle when I'm on vacation, but I just don't feel safe cycling to work and I don't feel safe having my children cycle to school. And we asked the question, what would make the difference? And one of the challenges we have right now is on many of our roads, there isn't clarity where the car belongs and where the cyclist belongs. And as a driver, I like it when there's clarity. I can't stand it when the cyclist is kind of wobbling around and I'm not sure how to get around them, if I should pass them, if I should hold, hold back. And it's awful for the cyclist because the cyclist too is making a whole variety of different judgments because it's not clear where they belong. This is about being very clear about where cyclists belong and it's about recognizing that cycling is going to be an important part of solving our congestion moving forward in the future. That's by way of introduction. That's some of the thinking that you see in that toolkit that you have in your hands today. And there's comment cards. You can provide comments and provide feedback to us. I am now going to welcome our event this evening. Thank you very much. everyone. Thanks very much. That was an excellent presentation, great video. Uh, my first task tonight is to introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, then we're going to have the panel come up. Uh, and I just have to ask, is the panel coming up before Alan speaks? After. And then I'll introduce the panelists. We've got a, a, a jam-packed program. I'm so happy to have been invited to do this. First, because I really care about this issue. And secondly, I just love the panel. So let me introduce Alan. Um, You've got his uh, bio in, your, uh, in, in what you were given out, but just, he's got amazing experience globally and now he's here. He's the Director of Transportation Consulting Practice at Steer Davies and Gleave. And that's where he's leading some projects now in the GTA. But he has 30 years of urban transit experience globally. I asked him what he was most proud of. He said he's most proud of designing and implementing the uh, Dublin LRT. And I've been to Dublin and Dublin is a fantastic city and he helped to make it that way. Um, he's done projects in London, Rome, Santiago, Atlanta, Portland, Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary, etc. But I would like to indicate that he was born in Liverpool, and he was only five years old when the Beatles first made it, they first presented and came out uh, with, their, with their singing. So I think that's important to know. Alan, come on up, please. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, very nice introduction. <laughs> um, making everything easier seemed like a good title. Uh, you think, well, that's clever. Where did you get that from? Um, <laughs> that's a real book. Uh, it does exist. Um, and that's one of the issues we have, I think. Um, we all walk, we bike, we ride, we drive, we get stuck in congestion, we get cross, we miss trains, we miss subways. That means we're all experts you know, in transport and traffic, and uh, that's the real issue. Uh, that's why you need some framework to make some decisions on what we do about it. Uh, if we don't, uh, <laughs> we keep on arguing for buses, for rail, read subway, LRT, BRT, pick your mode and have your fight. Um, but don't forget land use as well. For the car driver, check out the license plate. It's just trudgy. Uh, so we have to address these issues, but 
as Jennifer said, it's more about creating a new city and a new lifestyle. Um, so think carefully in how you plan these things. The challenge for me was, we've got all this framework, we're doing all this analysis, it's very comprehensive. Uh, are we doing the right thing? Uh, can you give us some examples from elsewhere? Uh, and how do we make it happen? So, we we'll start with Toronto. Um, I have to declare an interest here. And it's these two guys, they're my nephews. They live in Etobicoke. Uh, they were born in Liverpool, but they've been grown up here for 10 years. The twitchy one who wouldn't stand still and out of focus is 16 years old. Uh, he's already did, taken his driving lessons. Uh, he's, he's a bad lad, they shouldn't be doing that. Um, the guy on the right is, is smarter, obviously, he's in focus. Uh, he's the Etobicoke soccer team. Uh, he's at the University of Toronto and he thinks the subway is great because he can get to and from his classes on time. Um, I asked the both of them, he said, I'm over here doing this big thing. Um, the, the kind of common theme was, yeah, well, we've got our new phones and we're kind of uh, not really interested in transport and transit, but it is a bit of a mess. Can we just fix it? So there's an urgency to this as well. Fix it. Uh, big picture, 25 years. Okay. Um, they're going to be in their 40s by the time that's done. Uh, it's important to have this big picture, but how do we move it forward? Uh, and you've seen all this from, um, from Jennifer's presentation, but it's the moving minds piece as much as the technical content. Uh, we're, we're halfway through the process, as, as has been mentioned, and we have these criteria, these measures, these methods. I'm always thinking of these two nephews sitting there going, what the, what's he talking about? Um, what am I supposed to do with this? Uh, and is this the right outcome? Well, let's have a look at some other examples. Um, and mentioned Dublin, so let's go there first. Uh, it's not as big as Toronto, so the county of Dublin is probably about two and a half million, the city is about a million, a million and a half. Um, it's rich in history uh, and pubs, um, and that's an important part of the fabric of the city. Uh, if you want a recommendation, the Palace Bar, Bar on Fleet Street is the one to head for. Um, but, Years ago, we, we were asked to do a Dublin transportation initiative. It's the first time I'd linked uh, transportation and land use together. Uh, and you can see the list there. They did have this better use of existing assets. So they'd already thought about walking, cycling, access for all in 1991. So there's lots of cities ahead of you. They linked it to the land use. They had a multimodal approach. You can see there the list of, of modes. There's already an existing rail and metro networks. There was investment in that. The new light rail, uh, which Anne mentioned, uh, Luas is Gaelic for speed. Um, when it was going through the gritty, grimy construction period, Luas became long, ugly, and slow. So be careful what you wish for. Um, there's the plan. It's, you know, it's shown its age. It's a 20-year plan, updated every five years. It looked at the content, but also looked at delivery mechanisms as well. And that's maybe a, a, a theme we can pick up on in the discussion. It set up a Dublin transportation office, it set up a rail procurement agency to design and deliver the LRT. There were several packages that we assessed. The LRT was one key component. We proposed a three-line network, um, lots of benefits, traditional transportation benefits, but wider city-shaping opportunities as well. Um, long story, but our three-line network became two separate lines. Um, that's what they've built so far. But it's a game changer. It's modern LRT uh, linked to your land use changes. All the municipalities rewrote their land use plans to fit around LRT. And if you want to see what integration of land use and LRT looks like, that's it. Uh, brand new development, brand new light rail, very different city. Um, there are extensions planned already. They're down into the Docklands, into the financial district, and building that third line so that they are finally getting around to it. And here's the twist, here's the outcomes. Um, we've done all the right things. It's taken 20 years, but we've done it. Uh, Lewis has changed the shape of the city. Um, it's achieved all its transportation benefits, but it's done more than that. And I mentioned earlier on about the pubs. Well, here's a pub that's changed its name to the tram. That's my new kind of benchmark for whether we've succeeded in every city. Um, let's move to Liverpool. Uh, Again, a pretty old example, but I wanted to show you how the results had, had, had kind of materialised. So around about 1998, the incoming government, national government, said, right, we're going to do it differently. We're not going to do economic cost-benefit in isolation to choose how we invest. 
We're going to broaden it out. At the time, it's called the New Approach to, to Appraisal, we called it NATA. Uh, but you can see there, broadened it out to pick up environment, safety, economics, accessibility, integration, integration between modes and with land use. Um, and the, the whole system was based around a very simple approach called an appraisal summary table. So every project, every policy in every authority across the country had to adopt this approach. You won't see the detail here, but basically there's the five themes had to be on a single page. That was the key to it, a single page to assess a project. So the top left hand corner is your problem statement, middle column is definition of project and there's your assessment. And it was a mix of quantitative and qualitative measures. Uh, that's evolved over the last 10, 15 years. Um, and it's now kind of standard practice uh, around the world. So how do we apply that to Liverpool? Um, that's in case you don't know where Liverpool is. Um, there's the city, uh, four of the municipalities and a regional transit agency. So similarities again in terms of process and management. Um, if you think street grids are awkward, you should come and try and plan in Liverpool. Um, it's well, it's city charter in 1208, uh, and there's layer upon layer of, of city fabric. Um, halfway through planning a lot of this, and we'll come on to a, what we did in the downtown, it was designated as World Heritage Area as well. Um, so again, you know, interesting challenges. They already have transportation choice, they have suburban railway, they have underground stations, extensive bus network, um, airport and John Lennon International Airport, no less, um, and, and ferries. So that, why would they bother doing um, more of this? Well, it's a 10-year plan. Um, and again, it's multimodal. They can see the same list of, of components as we had in Dublin, but we applied this new methodology. Uh, it was comprehensive. We did it by corridor, we did it by area. Um, we did what was called a SWOT and SIFT. So that was strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, and then a sifting process to get um, from long list down to preferred package. Um, there was 85 applications across the whole of the UK. Uh, the top six were designated centre of excellence, and this was one of them. It did feature LRT, and that's never happened, but again, look at the process, high profile engagement of the public. Vital, vital, vital. So this session this evening and all the other events is exactly the right thing to do. But think back to those two little nephews that are kind of bugging me now. Um, the Tomorrow's Transit users. We did an awful lot with schools. Kids get excited, they take information home, it permeates through. We had a package here for, for a Liverpool project that was adopted in the school curriculum. So it was the history, the geography, everything. Um, start early, the little kid at the front that looks a bit like Shrek. Um, <laughs> he came up to me at the end of this session, this was about the light rail, and he said, uh, Mister, is the light rail going to be here next week? I said, mm, yeah, not really. <laughs> um, but again, we have to find a way of, of progressing these projects as quickly as we can. The, the, the decision, sound decision framework is, is certainly key to it. One of the packages we looked at was city centre movement strategy, and I thought it would be useful just to, to dwell on it for a moment. Uh, it picks up on all the themes Jennifer raised. It's about city shaping. What kind of city do we want? How do we improve conditions for walking, for cycling, um, for using transit to access? Um, I've called it complete streets here because it seems to be the language. We, we'd never heard it, or well, I'd never heard the phrase complete streets until about five years ago when I kind of turned up over here. Uh, we just assume that streets had sidewalks and trees and all the rest of it, but um, different, different parts of the world are a bit different. Um, but it was all comprehensive again. This is the downtown of Liverpool, looking at the needs of cars and goods vehicles. We don't ignore those when we're planning for pedestrians and, and transit. Um, this little character here is Superland Banana. He's, he's a bit of a part of a public arts programme and he's He's been adopted by the citizens of Liverpool, they're very fond of him. But it gives you a flavour of how you create different cities. Yes, you can do all of this transit and, and improvements, but it's, it's that bottom section, what we call the golden triangle. It was linking transportation with public realm, with new development. Um, there was an urgency as well, because the city, uh, this was around about 2004 or 5 we were doing this work. Um, they, had a, they were nominated and won an award to be European Capital of Culture in 2008. So that was a real sense of urgency created. And my nephews would like that because suddenly people are galvanised to get things done. 
you kind of almost need an event, and maybe the Pan Am Games is it, to galvanise you into action. There's the downtown plan, the blue areas of the developments. So we had a new arena, 10,000 seat arena, convention centre, a new museum on the waterfront, a world-class waterfront, a new shopping development, a million square feet, all done in four or five years. The city centre movement strategy was integral to those developments going ahead. So here we are, this is the start of the strategic road review. We have lots of big car parks in Liverpool downtown. They were seen as an asset, not a kind of ugly thing. They're part of the way the city functions. But we restructured the, the traffic routing. A lot of the through traffic was coming through a World Heritage area and we thought that's, that's not right. So the alternative was to reroute the traffic, still access to the car parks, um, but creating space that the pink area became a pedestrian priority area. So it's not pedestrianised, but it's geared for the pedestrian, wider footways, we unhooked the traffic signals so it wasn't a, a, a quick route through for traffic. It became an easy way to cross the road for pedestrians. Uh, and here's some of the, the, the output. This is the, the new bus station right next to the anchor store in the new retail development. And it was part of the planning condition. 67% of uh, visitors to the shopping centre had to be by non-car mode. That was a planning condition. So they were keen with that constraint for the developers to pay for a brand new bus station. So it shows that you can get these things done. The street works in the public realm was over $100 million worth uh, of investment. That's in. You can probably Google it by now and have a look on Street View. If you want any more information, let me know. It's all there. Um, and that assessment framework got us all the way through that process. Let's quickly whiz through. Sacramento, uh, we were asked to help them out. Um, how do we deal with sprawl? digging up green fields to, to build suburban sprawl. Um, how do we do it? They'd already worked out the land use plan. This is a 50 year plan. The one on the left is the orange area. Is if you continue as we are, this is the sprawl. If we constrain it, it's the version on the right hand side. What they hadn't thought about was transit. Um, so we brought in, alongside the land use blueprint, to do a 30 year transit action plan. Uh, they had a miserable, miserable 1% market share for transit. And even worse, we picked up a phrase in one of the documents, transit is a lifeline service for transit-dependent people. That kind of makes you a bit depressed, doesn't it? Um, so we brought in our multiple account framework, and we kind of spiced up a bit. We said, you know, from lifeline service to a lifeline choice. That's the challenge for transit. And we brought with us a little piece of our Liverpool work, and this is worth dwelling on. It's, it's how we plan the whole trip, so it's not just about buying buses or new trams or streetcars, it's how you get people to use transit. If you quickly look, look through that, that's, we call it getting rid of the barriers. So imagine, um, I don't know, let's imagine a nephew who might use transit occasionally. Um, what's he faced with? Um, I want to make a journey, how do I find out information on routes, on frequencies, how much does it cost to use, how do I get to the local transit stop? Is it safe? Is it signposted? Um, how long do I have to wait? Um, if I get on a, a, a transit vehicle, do I get a seat? How do I pay this exact fare? No change only, that's not very welcoming. Uh, if I get a seat, do I end up sitting next to a nice person or someone like me? Um, do I have to transfer on the way? How do I get to my final destination? End result, uh, so many questions. You know what, I'm just gonna drive. I'm gonna drive, forget it. All of those questions became policy um, elements for Liverpool and we transferred, so we had an information strategy, wayfinding strategy, uh, customer care training for staff, um, the whole package uh, was, was organised. We imported that to Sacramento, 50% of their streets um, haven't got sidewalks. Um, so we built a whole package, uh, that's the, the overall plan, but we built it up by mode, commuter rail, light rail, streetcar. Uh, the bus network, we, we redesigned it, we got it high bus, high frequency, high capacity, high quality piece it all together with local services. This was the killer diagram that persuaded the, um, the board to adopt our, our plan. This is the 15 minute walk catchment. They could see that whole package would, would capture the whole city. We had all the media uh, and outreach. We had willingness to pay as well. It wasn't just a blue sky package. It was how is it gonna be funded as well. Sacramento aspires to be Portland. Fortunately, we've worked in Portland. Um, Metro Portland have a long-term plan. Okay, um, very, very quickly, a whole range of criteria. 
Vancouver, uh, Portland aspires to be Vancouver, so this all hangs together quite nicely. The same multiple account applied to a corridor at the university, looking at different modes, um, again, multiple account, there's deliverability in there, the middle account is deliverability, but from long list to short list, um, those are the final recommendations, but guess what, this is how we assessed it, it looks familiar. Um, some conclusions and a closing thought on behalf of my nephews. Um, you're basically doing the right thing with a whole range of ticks there. Um, you're thinking about funding, you're thinking about a, a, a sound decision framework, you're thinking about all the modes, um, you're doing good. Um, other things to think about, the partnership working. All of those examples have benefited from partnership, um, from quick wins as well as long-term projects. Um, you can see it, it's all about a, creating an attractive city. Back to Liverpool for one final thought. Um, get on with it. Thank you very much. We've done a lot of work, I've done a lot of work on this infrastructure issue, and uh, she mentioned that we're suffering from the consequences of a long period of non-investment. Just to give you another way of looking at the facts, between 1955 Remember, 1954, we started the subway. In 1977, new investment in Canada on infrastructure grew at the rate of about 4.8% annually, which was equivalent to population growth and also growth of, of, of cities. Starting in 1978, we had had this national program review and everything was going to be cut. Between 1978 and 2000, new investment plummeted drastically. And the precise number by which we grew on average was decimal 1% a year. That changed in about 2000. I wonder why we're behind. <laughs> uh, there's now a huge gap. It's been estimated at $125 billion to $250 billion. The numbers are so big they're meaningless. But half of the infrastructure gap in Canada is municipal. And here we're talking maintenance, renewal, as well as expansion. Most of tonight is about expansion. The second other fact is that fare box revenues in Canada average 60% of total operating costs. But the subsidies in Canada are far lower than they are in Europe far lower than they are in the US. So, to discuss how we change this whole situation and get our new investment going, I'm now going to introduce our panelists. They're going to speak in the following order. Councillor Karen Stintz is going to speak first. Her bio is in your book, so I'm not going to read it, but I've had a chance to get to know Karen in the last two years, and I find that she is genuine, committed, thoughtful, knowledgeable, thinks a lot about transportation. We're so excited to have you here tonight. Our next speaker was Barry Lyon. Now, Barry and I go back, quite, when we were teenagers, we were involved in the David Crombie campaign. Actually, I almost was, the truth is. And you too, Barry. And um, I have found that on, as the years have passed, whenever there's a major issue, Barry and I tend to find ourselves uh, sort of on the same side of it. So therefore, he is a very good person to have on this panel, and his judgment is excellent. <laughs> our next speaker, our next speaker is Dr. Mike Evans, who's coming from St. Mike's Hospital, where they're doing a fantastic number of things. I just met with him there on homelessness issues. If you read his bio, you'll see that he is putting art, the worlds of art and medicine, together. He's extraordinarily creative, and he gets more hits on YouTube than any doctor in the country. And I'm not sure what that's about, but he's here. <laughs> he may have it. I'm assuming it's related to what he does professionally. I have no idea. <laughs> but he is definitely a hit on YouTube. Our last speaker, you do know, because she's our Jennifer Kieseman, who I think is just bringing a fresh perspective here to planning. Uh, she's uh, smart and engaging, and she's fun, and she's inclusive, and she is a breath of fresh air. I've had the chance to get to have dinner with Jennifer a few times this past year, and I just want to say I think we're extremely lucky to have her. So that, that, ladies and gentlemen, is your panel. And I'm going to start with Councillor Karen Stintz, and I forgot to say that I think we're very lucky to have people of your caliber willing to enter the public arena. Thank so you. Karen, <laughs> Thank you your, your speech in three minutes on this issue. <laughs> three minutes or less, oh my goodness. Um, no, I think that this is very timely and, and uh, well overdue that we have a discussion about how we assess our priorities. Because, uh, you know, as we all know, the last election uh, threw our priorities into question. And, uh, you know, I've been on council for 10 years. We had a plan. It was called the Transit City Plan. It was a partially funded plan. And then the results of the municipal election called that plan into question. 
And I, I think that if we are really dedicated and committed to building a network that's going to link our city together and do all the things that we want to do with social equity, connectivity, um, choice, transportation, that we need to have a, a plan that is stable, consistent, and one that we can believe, believe in. And so as we enter into tonight and we talk about the ways that we want to evaluate the projects to make sure that we have a plan that we can rely on, it is important to hear from you whether or not we have, in fact, picked the right ways to evaluate these projects. And um, I am excited because if we, can, if we can have a discussion about how we prioritize projects, then we've already won the funding battle. And right now where I get concerned is we, we're talking about funding, we're not talking about projects. And if we continue to talk about funding for too long, I think we are at risk of having that discussion take over and not allowing us to see that, that we're actually talking about investments. And so what I hope that City Council can, can do um, through this exercise is be able to get excited again about what we're building as a city and that we can talk to people about the investments that we're making and that we can, those investments can be backed up with some rigor and so we all can start being, singing from the same songbook, going together, moving forward and uh, building the transit system that's long overdue. So thank you for coming tonight and helping us with this exercise. Thanks very much, Karen. Where are your thoughts on the process, on the framework, the analytical framework, and uh, because we know each other for a long time, I want you to be very candid, even if some of your thoughts are teeny bit critical. Okay. <laughs> you ever have one of those days when nothing goes right? You sleep in, you're late for work, uh, it's pouring rain, your umbrella's broken, the dog's growling at you, your spouse or partner tells you not to hurry back. You just want to be incredibly alone and contemplate life and your part in it. Two choices, a dinghy out in Lake Ontario or the Rosedale subway platform uh, or Glen Home. Good transit planning is all about ridership. The more the riders, the more successful the line. A successful transit line is crowded, not jammed, not young and not king and not queen, but crowded. We are a little short-sighted in our current transportation planning often. We're taking lines through mature areas with limited development capacity around stations. Transit is a young person's vehicle mode. The younger they are, the better the chance we can attract them and keep them on transit. Older folks get stuck in their ways and are less inclined to use transit and to stick with their, stick with their cars. So good transportation planning is about demographics, is about youth, is about reaching into employment areas. Good transit ends up on one end or the other of the grid in, in a major employment area. I really question why, well I know why, it's, it's funding, but why the Eglinton LRT ends at Black Creek. What an exciting place to terminate. Uh, a supermarket and an arena and a playing field. Heavy generation traffic. Where it should have gone was into Hazelville, Mississauga, um, around uh, airport corporate center. Major employment node just south of the airport. Now you really have something tying into Mississauga's new BRT down to their uh, town center and down to uh, ultimately to the uh, Cooksville and Port Credit GO stations. We need that grid, we need that connectivity. We just are missing the point in, in not assessing the importance of ridership. Neighborhoods may object. If, if, if I were king, I would say you don't get any, uh, any funding for any form of, of transit unless you provide, through increased density, the uh, uh, ridership that makes it work and, and helps it survive over the years and isn't a drain on our kids and our, and our kids' kids. So that, that's my thinking on transit. Our number one, our best decongestant right now is the DRL, the Downtown Relief Line. You know where it's going, roughly down Pape across maybe Eastern, picking up um, the exciting New Athletes Village, um, the distillery coming across maybe Wellington, maybe Queen, coming through the employment area, picking up Liberty Village, maybe up the rail corridor to Bloor, siphoning traffic off the terrible mess that Young and Bloor is. That is good planning and we can get the density around those stations to, to make them work. So that's very important. 
Cycling, of course. Um, it's great to see Sherburn working. Uh, it's great to see the ridership in, in improving. I'm on, a, I'm on a bike route, a busy bike route. Great to see. Sidewalks, Karen, I have a beef. I don't know why we're doing such narrow sidewalks downtown. They're no wider than Lawrence or Shepherd. Um, go around the corner here, we've got five foot wide sidewalks with a huge crowds funneling around them. We're building buildings out to the property line without thinking about. Uh, as a brisk walker, um, I would ask for express lanes <laughs> uh, so that I can pass people who are enjoying themselves, how dare they? Uh, and get to uh, get to my next ap you know, appointment in time. But I, I think, um, if you think we've got congestion now, uh, get used to it and get used to a lot worse. There's a tremendous gestation period for transit lines. Figure 10 years anyway, maybe 15. That DRL is 2025, maybe later. We have got 10 to 15 years of increasing congestion. The condominium community, we're looking at another 50,000 residents in the downtown area south of Bloor in the next five to seven years. We've got four million square feet of office development coming. There's another 20,000 people on a tight road network, on a limited transit network, skinny sidewalks, thank goodness for the PATH system, um, which is working well and, uh, and freeing up our sidewalks. Good news is Toronto is going to maintain its popularity. This island of tranquility we have in a sea of turmoil will continue being a tremendous magnet for immigration, for growth. We just need to plan our transit in, and all our modes of transportation in sync with this inevitability. Thanks. Thanks very much, Barry. That was great. One point of clarification because they would say that they did take account of ridership in the affordability uh, in the affordability measure. Is your concern that they didn't weight it enough or that the actual numbers aren't accurate? No, I think they're being optimistic. Um, it's right. very expensive. Let's take Eglin as an example. Very expensive to assemble land. Lots of little skinny properties that you have to assemble. It's not going to be easy. I think we've got another Danforth coming with almost nothing going on around the station. So you're questioning the actual numerical analysis. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, Mike, uh, to you. Fire away. Even though there's quite a bit of skepticism in your voice when you describe me as a doctor on YouTube. <laughs> I was like, actually, that was, that was respect. Okay. Uh, so I guess uh, just to kind of segue from that, uh, I'm a doctor, not a city planner. And um, uh, so I, I guess the question is, what am I doing here? And I'm sometimes wondering the same thing. Uh, so let me just see if I can answer that. So. Uh, let me start with a question and, and then uh, an answer and then maybe I'll link it to uh, Toronto and city planning. So if, if I said, uh, you know, here's, uh, I've got a magic uh, pill that will uh, reduce arthritis by 42 percent, uh, reduce uh, depression by 30 percent, a low dose, uh, high dose about 44 uh, percent, reduce anxiety by uh, 42 percent, uh, heart attacks by 40 percent, uh, colorectal cancer by 30 percent. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. Alzheimer's, uh, you know, what we're all fearful of, uh, losing our memory bank uh, by about 50%. Um, and, and that uh, magic pill, of course, uh, is, is not a, a fancy diet and it's not a fancy pill. It's, 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 it's exercise. Uh, it's walking. Uh, it's moving. Um, and uh, for most people, that's just walking. For some, it's cycling, but uh, really it's walking. We're, we're creatures of habit. When we look at, um, you know, there's just a recent trial looking at uh, comparing my generation, so baby boomers, uh, to our parents' generation, not quite mad men, but somewhere in between. And, uh, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Our, our, we live a little bit longer, uh, we smoke less, we work out more, uh, but our health outcomes are actually about the same. The chronic disease rates are about the same. The self reported health status is about the same. And the big difference is sitting. Um, we sit a lot, uh, whether we're commuting, uh, sitting, watching YouTube, uh, 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 computers, and of course uh, TVs. Uh, our lives have become um, about easiness. Uh, you know, we're pushing the button so the door opens automatically. 
uh, we're pushing doors to our cars, all doors all open. Everything's about trying to make it easier. And, uh, you know, if you look at the average steps that we take, you know, average male, maybe the StatScan data is about 9,300 steps, and women are about 7,400, which I think is a bit high. The U.S. are doing worse. If we look at, I don't know, the average Amish guy now, so I, I kind of step back, uh, uh, they're walking about um, 18,000 steps a day. Women are walking about 15,000 steps a day. So the couch or sitting is our kind of generation cigarette. Um, so when we, just to link it back uh, uh, to, the, to the work we're talking about here, when we look at the walkability of neighborhoods, uh, uh, you know, if you have a high rating walkability neighborhood, uh, your chance of walking is almost treble, 2.7 times. Uh, if uh, uh, the reverse is true, so if, if you have a low walkability neighborhood, much higher rates of diabetes, uh, especially to new immigrants, new uh, comers to Canada. Um, when we uh, look at um, uh, uh, just uh, the the uh, sort of quality of life of individuals uh, in uh, low walkability neighborhoods, it drops uh, significantly. When we look at transit use, uh, which is obviously linked to activity, uh, if you're in a high walkability neighborhood, that goes up uh, two and a half times. Um, uh, when we even look at BMI, the BMI, uh, the weight of, of individuals uh, drops just a bit. And, and by the way, it's, it's interesting, when we look at obesity, you know, so everybody's always about obesity, uh, I'll take a obese active patient, when we look at the health outcomes, their health outcomes are much better than the skinny sedentaries. So I've got lots of obese patients in my practice that are very active. I'll take them over a person who doesn't move any day of the week from a, from a health outcome point of view. So I think uh, uh, when we're thinking about uh, the health of a population, it's possible that, that Jennifer and her team are actually more predictive uh, than my hospital and, and uh, you know, a lot of the kind of, uh, uh, you know, the people that do reactive care like I do. Uh, when we look at uh, where health care problems are solved, one in a thousand problems makes it into the big academic health care center that I work at. Two, a third makes it into primary care, but two thirds of health care problems are actually solved at home. When we look at chronic diseases, the opportunities are around uh, uh, changing our, our thinking, changing our activity, and really uh, about uh, what I call micro change and looking at our habits. We're creatures of habits. It's not that huge change. It's a small little tweak, uh, a kind of reflective habit tweaker is what I'm looking for uh, in a patient. And I think that, uh, you know, our thinking around these formulas, that our, our formula for a happy life is a bigger house and a more expensive car and more cars. Uh, uh, but when we now look at it, it's like, you know, we're now communicating that muffin that you have at Starbucks, it's 400 calories. Now we say that's about 40 minutes of walking. And, and the way people understand that is different. I think the way we give people options and where they live uh, will change as well. So when we, when we say, hey, you're going to be able to have a house in a high walkability neighborhood, that's actually going to you know, lead to better health, uh, better quality of life, uh, more likelihood that you'll cycle to work uh, rather than drive, uh, dropping in the commuting. We all know uh, what a terror commuting is on our health. And so I think uh, that's what's going to be very interesting to me is our equations around you know, what, what we want out of life, what our happiness is, uh, where we're going with all this is, is going to change. And so I think that's why I'm here and, and why Jennifer is more important than I am. So thank you very much for having me. So Mike, just to, to wrap up that, do you feel comforted then when you read these eight uh, criteria that, that they've created as the framework? Do you feel that your concerns about ensuring that that walking is, is, is built into our uh, our uh, travel yeah. system. Do you feel good about the, the, the way they've designed the framework? Yeah, I think the framework. Uh, you know, even just to be in the game. You know, I'm, I'm sure I, I actually don't know this, but ten years ago, I'm sure that wasn't one of the factors that was in the game. And this is a problem with our world. It's so siloed. In my world, you know, we're talking about diabetes, or we're talking about hypertension, or we're talking about, and, and really it's all heart disease. And I, I think uh, when we look at the health of populations, uh, it's very much predicted by our education, our walking, and all these factors. So, so for, for me to be here, mm -hmm. and for Jennifer to be speaking at my hospital, this is the sort of mm -hmm. new uh, world. What I think we need to get a little bit better at is 
uh, kind of the risk communication to the public, like mm -hmm. so that people kind of understand that a bit more. Um, and uh, I ran a medical school for the public, uh, uh, and this was always the most uh, interesting talk for people because they know they knew all about smoking and, <laughs> and alcohol and uh, all the other things, but they didn't understand uh, the city planning uh, or education. Um, or early childhood parenting uh, was these huge predictors of health outcomes. You know, there's an interesting book out last year uh, comparing the health of city people in cities around the world, but particularly in, in North America. And people are the healthiest and live the longest, I was surprised to read, in New York City. Yeah. And that is because in New York City you have to walk. Having lived there for <coughs> years, you don't want to be driving there. And uh, I thought that because most people, I think, associate New York with sort of maybe polluted air or not, but it is actually the place where people live the healthiest and the longest. Jen, last but not least, in terms of an opening statement for the panel. Well, first I just want to say that when uh, Mike started talking and he said, you know, he was going on and on about all these things, this magic pill, all these 40% reductions, I was thinking, let it be urban planning. It's urban planning is the pill. My day of vindication. We came pretty close with, uh, with walkability. I'm happy with that. I'll, ta I'll, I'll, I'll take it. But I, I like the way um, the three panelists so far have framed this. You know, Karen talking about the importance of moving about, talking about revenue, which is really abstract, to talking about investment. What is it that we get as, as an outcome? Uh, and I think that's really important because the risk to us is that we don't actually make the connections in talking about where transit goes and in talking about spending this money to what you're talking about, Mike, which is quality of life. This is actually about a whole variety of different ways that we can make our lives better. And how we plan our city can make our lives better. And I learned last weekend that in New York City, they have a third of the carbon footprint of the rest of America on average that New, New Yorkers um, uh, emit um, only a third or consume a third of what is consumed in other parts of, of the country. So there's that sustainability imperative as well in creating walkable, urban, dense places. And the reason that we kind of structured this process the way that we did, and we have that criteria, and we have all this kind of complex thinking, and it kind of feels like it's a lot of stuff to get through, is because we wanted to try to make some of those connections about urban planning and the kind of city we're trying to create to make that really transparent. Not unlike what you're doing in having your conversations with your patients about talking about walkability and talking about neighborhoods and talking about lifestyle. It's about connecting all of this conversation to having better lives. Lives where we're healthier, lives where our children are safer. Uh, lives where we have a sense of community because we walk down our streets and we know our neighbors as opposed to never having a presence in the public realm. And so somehow this whole conversation has to come back again and again to that idea of making our lives better. This is about having something that is currently at risk. Okay, thanks very much, Jennifer. And I think um, all of the panelists have, first of all, talked about in one way or another the benefits of this approach. Karen feels that it's very important now that finally we're coming to this kind of discussion. Uh, Barry is questioning um, some of the uh, analysis, and I want to get to that. We're going to have a discussion among ourselves. Um, all of the, the, the health benefits of having a, 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 a transit transportation system that is broad, encompasses walking, cycling, all the modes of transportation where it's integrated with land use, which has been something that I've been myself pressing for about 15 years. So uh, the panel is very positive. In about 15 minutes, we're going to turn to you and ask whether this approach resonates with you. Uh, and furthermore, I'm going to add a second question to the audience, and that is, are the benefits and risks being adequately communicated? So we're, but we're going to get to you and ask you about ridership. Uh, do you think he's right? You haven't paid enough attention to the uh, real ridership, ridership uh, predictions for Edmonton? Is that just a political decision that you're really not you're going through a mature area, ending up nowhere except a nice park? For well, the reality the reality along Edmonton is there are large areas that already are mature and they're relatively low density, and there's areas that we're not going to see a significant amount of change. What that means is each one of those areas where we can see change, we need to make sure that they're not being underdeveloped. And I do think that's a risk, particularly with respect to the station areas, that we need a tremendous amount of intensity 
um, in those station areas. Which is going to be provocative. Let's take Chaplin. Is council going to vote for intensification of Chaplin and Eglinton? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, that's one of the areas where we, we could, we, you know, if we can work with the development industry, and, and it's one of the challenges we have because it's not one of intent, it's one of timing. And so trying to find a developer that will be developing at the same time we're building the station is a challenge. Um, in New York, what, they, what they've done is they've said to the development community, we'll build the station such that you can put your development on top of it at the time that you're ready to develop. And so we, um, so we have to start thinking a bit more strategically because the way that we've done it in the past is that we've developed the stations in absent of a partner and then we now have these beautiful testaments to architecture that are surrounded by greenfields. So can I just interject there to, uh, on the Eglinton, because what we've done on Eglinton is that this is of course being developed by Metrolinx, mm -hmm. and Metrolinx is going out and finding a partner through Infrastructure Ontario, so there's a lot of, lot of different players at the table, and at, to Karen's point, beautiful station designs, all one-story stations, to which planning responded and said, you know what, friends, we actually, they shouldn't even be stations, they should just be buildings, when you come up the subway, you're in a building, and we should have intensification. And we've had a real struggle, and Barry can maybe comment on this, because it gets down to the complexity of having a whole variety of players building a city, which is that the response from Metrolinx was, well, the people who are going to build the station are different people than pe the developers that would build a building. And so we have been working with Metrolinx to do exactly what Karen has suggested, to ensure that in their request for proposal process, that they actually um, prioritize respondents who indicate that they will put the infrastructure in place that enables future development. So is there any chance, like this issue of different players collaborating with each other is one that you could go through every single planning issue right across the country, Ottawa where I lived for 11 years, this is really tricky. And Barry, you're a real estate consultant. I mean, is there any chance of this actually happening this time that Metro Links will listen to the advice of of city planning and that we'll write. Yeah, and, and so, you know, and I think that our success will be in our ability to, to identify key locations, because I don't think we're gonna get the development across the entire line, but certainly to your point, Chaplin and Edmonton, uh, Avenue Road and Edmonton, I, mean, I think there are locations that lend themselves to the kind of development that, uh, that we're talking about. And if we are strategic and thoughtful and committed uh, to, 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 to three, four, or you know, maybe even five locations, I think we can get the kind of development that we're talking about. So, Barry, are you happy with that answer? <laughs> I'm not going to tell a politician I'm not happy with the answer. No, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, I wouldn't know what, what to do if someone said they were... <laughs> what we have... <laughs> As Karen knows full well, the, the problem on, on Eglinton is the underground portion from Brent Cliff or wherever, maybe, maybe now Don Mills, uh, out, all the way to Black Creek. Um, you've got an underground streetcar system. People not real, may not realize every station is going to have full escalators, full elevators, huge vent shafts, yeah. big costs, big operating costs. What should be happening in, in an in a apolitical world is that, and Metrolinx is a terrific agency, I, yeah. I really good job. admire what they're doing, yeah. but, but in a perfect world, they would be uh, putting together the land around each station themselves buying it, expropriating it, whatever it takes. But they within. don't have that power because they're well, just a... this is what, they, what should be happening. Yeah. They acquire it and then they put it out to bid to the private sector. Highest bidder takes mm -hmm. and, uh, and then the density comes in, the design comes in, the integration comes in. Right now, it's just holus bolus. You get lucky, maybe you don't. Uh, maybe you can assemble, maybe you can't. Uh, Chaplin is an example, what do we got? An ambulance station. Uh, a fire station, a Mr. Lube, the Beltline Park, um, not too promising for, uh, for, for, for development, but it could happen with, with a body that assembled the land, thought ahead, and said, we're going to generate the density, the young ridership that these lines need, and we're not doing that. Other questions? Coffee time there that I think will lend itself to a nice five or six story building, which is quite appropriate for mid rise development along Edmonton as a local councillor. I can attest to that. I thought they did do it a long time ago with Davisville yeah. and Young, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, and it is, I mean, when, when I um, 
I'm a, I'm a huge advocate of the Young University Spadina Line Extension, and I think it is, for many, for many, many reasons, a, a good investment. We can, you know, connect York University um, to, to the network with mass transit. We take 2,000 buses off the road. We have real opportunities to develop Downs View and, uh, you know, in, in the, the ideas that you guys are talking about. But my God, if you've seen those stations, like, good Lord, like they really are. They are architectural wonders, but there's, they're, they are not a testament to the kind of densities that one would normally associate with the, um, with the mass investment that we're making in this line. So I, I, do, I do think we won't repeat that mistake, and I think the question is whether we, we can seize the opportunity. But, and, and I believe we can. I think a lot of it is um, about timing. Uh, I'm not sure I'm allowed to say the word Mississauga, but we're working there in their downtown. They've... The, they have a downtown 21 plan to recreate yeah. the square one as a yeah. vibrant downtown. Um, we're in there doing a downtown movement plan linked to their light rail proposals. It's all about timing because Oxford and Morgan, the big landowners, want to do lots of office development. The timing is critical. If you can get all the pieces to align, there's potential there. And it's the same, the example I gave in Liverpool, that big shopping development, a million square feet, it was Grosvenor Estates. Um, it was it was putting in the planning conditions a 67% by non-car mode that brought them to the table seriously thinking about transit. They had to to get the planning permission. So again, it was all about the timing of the deal. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that. But it's not the time. An even better. Sorry, and I'll, sorry, I won't hop in the mic here. But the uh, I think an even better opportunity is where the bus bays are at Young and Eglinton, mm -hmm. because we actually own that land. Mm -hmm. I say we the city, like so we have we have I think of any of any of the opportunities that's the best one that presents itself. And also young is getting it. Young and Eglinton is now getting intensified. It is, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's kind of alarming quite a bit. <laughs> um, Mike, did you want in on any of these issues? No, I, uh, what I found interesting in Alan's slides was uh, willingness to pay. Uh, this is a thing we use in medicine quite a bit. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, here's your disease, here's your problem. Uh, would you be willing to pay, you know, ten dollars, twenty dollars, fifty dollars? And we find it a very uh, kind of interesting way to gauge uh, this sort of quality of life outcome. Mm -hmm. That I'd be willing to actually pay more taxes if I could have this or or, or not. So I, I, I so I, I don't have a comment, just a question. Um, I wondered how that pays because it seems to me an interesting thing to kind of put it back to the people here. Would you be willing to pay more uh, for this? Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and is that is something that's commonly used? Um, well, uh, sorry, yeah. I'm hogging again. No, no, you know, I said I wouldn't. No. But you know, and, and, I, and I think the one thing to your point is, yeah, would you pay more taxes for a better quality of life? Um, I think another question is, um, would you? Um, how how much do you value your investment, your own personal investment, which for most people is their house? For me, it's my, my biggest asset. And if, if um, you know, I think what we're not recognizing is that if, if my house and my asset is going to continue to maintain its value and increase in its value, it's only because people are, want to choose to come to Toronto and live here and buy my house at some point in the future. And the way that we make Toronto a desirable city that people want to continue to come and choose to live here is to invest in walkable cities and transit and the kinds of infrastructure that is going to draw people to to our city. And we have been the beneficiary of the of, of, of a one city. Uh, that is growing. It continues to grow. Uh, my family is from Baltimore on my father's side, and it's um, you know we see that you can't. That there's population exodus out of Baltimore for the longest time. It's now turning itself around. When you see how Detroit has hollowed out and what that's meant for land values, it's just it's shocking to think about. We in Toronto don't have that, but 20 years, 30 years, we need to continue to be looking to the future to make sure we are the city that people choose to continue to come to when they can go to Paris, New York, Milan, Hong Kong, Singapore. They can go anywhere. We want them to come here. And so, like, just from a pure selfish perspective, if you want to maintain the value of your biggest asset, you've got to invest in the things that make a city livable. But it's interesting. That's uh, this idea that if you don't invest in competitiveness, um, down the line, uh, you know, the value of what we have. And Toronto itself will become less significant. There's an article in the Knights of Columbus written by Dan Hornwick, uh, in which he shows that right now Toronto is one of the top 100 cities in the world. But by 2050, we're going to be one of the top 300. Even New York, which is now fourth in the world, is going to go down to like 15th. The rise of the cities around the world, um, the, the, the issue of competitiveness is, is just huge. I want to raise a, a, another issue because uh, it wasn't raised in anybody's speeches, but 
Um, and that is the level of cynicism and distrust among the general population. It seems to me that the debate, the political and public debate, is not about the quality of the transit plan. People are not saying, gee, I really think Metro Links is a great plan, I really think these, these 10 proposals are fantastic, but it's, well, whatever, but there's so much waste in government that if they, you know, sure, they can do what they want, but I don't feel I should have to pay my taxes. I've never seen levels of cynicism so high in my 40 years of public uh, policy. And um, I know you've been trying so hard to communicate and engage people. Have you encountered any of that? Uh, well, I think that... Um, or the people who come out are probably the people who actually care about public policy and investment. Well, I think, well, I think that's true. But I also think that um, there is a very high level of cynicism right now. That's absolutely true. And one of the reasons, and it's one of the reasons why we've approached this phase of this process the way that we have, is that it's about good information. It's about getting beyond rhetoric. It's about getting beyond, it's about understanding, making the connections to health, making the connections to quality of life, instead of just phrasing and positioning everything as a tax. It's about shifting from a, you know thinking and talking about taxes to thinking and talking about investment. And so, you know, I think a really big part of our challenge, and we're a big city, so it's really tricky to have these conversations. A big part of our challenge is how do we, how do we have more meaningful conversations with good information? And how do we build our capacity? And our, you know, that's been our whole approach, is to kind of shift the conversation from being positional, where people back into a corner. Um, some of you may have seen the press on this consultation that we did on Sunday. We did a cycling tour, and we did consultation, part of our consultations in the mode. We've been doing walking, cycling, on bus, uh, in transit stations. And what was fascinating about it was that we had a Toronto Sun reporter who did the consultation. She rented a Bixie bike. She wrote about it the next day. You can Google and read it online. But the title of the article, I went, finally, after nine months, there's an article I'm in a frame. And the title of the article was, Toronto Sun reporter no longer hates cyclists. <laughs> I was the title of the article. And you know what? It was brilliant. Tipping point. It was a tipping. <laughs> she came in and she had an experience. And she went from seeing the city one way to going, wait a minute, cycling is a, is a legitimate form of transportation. And oh my God, it's dangerous on university where there's no cycling lane. And oh my goodness, did I ever feel safe on Sherborne. Mm -hmm. And you know, so that, I think we need to have more experiences like that where we're moving beyond our positional corners and we're actually getting out and having conversations and shifting the conversation from being really them against us. And we get trapped in that a lot in this city. Okay, so but, now we'd like to... Sorry, I think the cynicism point, you have to link it back to some of the themes in my presentation about quick wins and actions. You need something tangible, because it's, it's a bit of an abstract. We've got to pay taxes for something which might turn up eventually. The classic is London congestion charge. Yeah. The funding that that generated was, you know, everybody wanted improvements to the underground network, but it was such a long lead time, the mayor at the time said, you know what, I'm going to invest in a brand new bus fleet. So the day that congestion charge kicks in, there's new buses coming down the road. Mm -hmm. but that was that was the trick. That was tangible. Making the connection. You could see what I was yeah. getting for my ten pounds a day congestion charge was a brand new bus as an alternative. Yeah. I mean, so I'm, 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 I think I want to. Can I? No, no. Want? I just I I, I, I mean I, I think one one is about the money and one is about who's spending it on our behalf, right? And it's mm -hmm. so there's a cynicism element. There's also just a you know I, when you think about which I learned today, if you want to take your family of four to the Raptors, you're going to pay about $400 by the time you get the tickets, get down there, get your food, park your car. To, to where? To the Raptors. Basketball. Basketball. <laughs> 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 I've heard of the Raptors. Yeah, Raptors. <laughs> I, won't, I won't talk about the Leafs, because I mean, that's way out of my, my snack racket. But, um, but you know, if you want to take your family to the Raptors, you're going to spend the same amount of money as you're going to invest in transit. The issue is that I enjoy a night out with my family at the Raptors. I don't enjoy giving $500 a year to a government that I'm not sure is going to deliver something to me. And so it's not, it's not that I don't know that it's a cynicism around the, the, the politicians. It's, it, it's, I think it's the reluctance to, um, to, to, to part with money that is hard earned to, to, towards a vision that's not well explained to a benefit that I'm not sure I'm going to receive. Or to a benefit that you won't benefit from, but your exactly. children will. Yeah. Can we get the lights on so I can we can see our audience? Possible, Daniel. Yeah. Um. Yes, Barry. 
Can I ask a question while we're waiting for that? Indeed. Of, of, uh, of Karen and, and, and of Jen. Um, we're getting really good at talking about this. And it's wonderful that you know, Fitting and Justice has put it out there and there's great response back. Um, but at some point we're going to talk ourselves to death. When, how do we make things happen? Well, this plan is going to, to council in November. Yeah. And presumably, uh, we've got a, it depends, I mean, we have a, our current premier is in favor of major investment, whether or not city council votes for it. I mean, we have an, a, a, a premier bias towards investment in infrastructure. And I will say, thank goodness. And um, uh, so that's, but it can't happen. There has to be a certain process. It's going into council in November. I guess that's the first. Well, you know, and I, I, you know, I just got to say, <laughs> I, I got to say, like, you know, Toronto, granted, we've had a little bit of, 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 of an underinvestment over the last 20 years, but, but I like to call our attention to what we are building. We're building a link to the airport finally, and that's going to be open by 2015. We are building a subway extension as we speak that is going to link, that's going to actually make our system regional because it's going to go to York Region. It's going to, as I say, it's going to connect York University into the, into the transit network, the subway network. And that's great. We're, that's we're, great. We've started construction on a, on a 19 kilometer line across Eglinton after the poor thing was filled in, uh, you know, a couple decades ago, right? We're actually building more transit than any city in North America. And yet we're talking as if we're stuck. We're not stuck. We just need to keep the momentum going. We're just behind, but we're getting the wheels turning again. Yeah, and the yeah. challenge is we're 30 years behind, to Anne's point, about our underinvestment over a 30-year period. Yeah. And the risk is that next wave of projects, the downtown relief That's line. Right. The downtown relief right. line, we need it now. But it's if we're really, really fast, if we could all agree today that we should build it and fund it, it's 10, 15 years out. Yeah. So the challenge is, is that that next wave, which we already need that today, one, that one I we're like not planning be, that yet. I would like that one to be very, very fast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, now, it's very hard for us to see, but there's a microphone here and here, so line up behind them. I do see, I do see three people here. I don't see anybody on... Oh, here. There's one in front, too. Okay, so what I'm going to do is go from mic to mic. So first of all, the gentleman in the white shirt, then we're going to come down to you, sir, in front. Say your name and uh, ask your question, please. Uh, my name is Jai Kalewa. Uh, I'm an engineer, and uh, I have a comment before the question. <laughs> brief. Yes, very brief. <laughs> uh, uh, we, we engineers, we speak in uh, equations, so we are always brief. <laughs> uh, <coughs> we, we have a problem. Uh, Barry wants an express uh, lane on the sidewalk. I want a bike lane on most of the streets. Uh, we can't move the buildings. So where do we get the space for it? Right. Obviously, the easiest way to get it is from the cars. And how do we do that? Uh, to do that, we must address the question of um, the latest addition in the last decade or so of the SUVs and Hummers, all the big cars that are coming, opening doors and having uh, two feet long mirrors. I mean, So you've asked a very important question and also I really endorse that question because uh, a number of us though were pro-transit and pro-walking, like I'm a terrific walker, but I don't want us to be anti-car either. So where does the space no, come from? No, I'm not anti-car. What I'm saying is there are too many people driving big cars and driving them alone. What we should be doing is charging more tax on big cars so that those people come down to a reasonable size. Okay, so that's And smaller cars will give us room for bigger sidewalks and bike lanes. Uh, and maybe even public transit if you and consider who, who, who would you like to answer that question, one person? I, I, I really think this question can't be answered municipally, but I'm asking it here because I think these people can raise it to the progressive provincial premier Kathleen Wen. She can do it. Okay. If you Anybody want to take that question on the panel? 
Well, I can, I'll, I'll make a very quick observation, which is that we have a user fee policy at the city, and uh, we're very fond of the city of making sure people always pay their fair share. Yeah. So in the development industry, you're submitting a proposal, um, you actually pay for the services of the planning department to, to deliver uh, on your project. Uh, the comment is very consistent with the user pay yes. policy, which would yeah. be to say a person who's driving a smart car and a person who's driving a very large car has yeah. a different impact on the infrastructure, yeah. and you take up more space, yeah. your, the wear and tear is greater, is there not a rationale for having some kind of fee? The challenge is that, of course, politically, that's a very tricky road to yeah. go down. So, I mean, I, I have another solution that's politically just as charged, even though it doesn't cost anybody anything. And that is to allow people to park near subway stations during the day. Which to allow people to park? Near subway stations during the day. And not on the major roads. So, but I know because I represent I represent the area of Young and Lawrence, Young and Eglinton, and Young Young and York Mills that all the residents have parking restrictions because they don't want people parking in front of their house. Right. It is a, a political issue, but that would be that would help. But but if we think if we could let people park on neighborhoods existing neighborhood streets off the main in, off the main arterial roads, and and we could if we could if I were queen for the day and I had a big claw that could scoop up those UPS tracks. And the Canon Post trucks that park on the lanes block up an entire lane. That would do more to help ease our congestion than I think charging SUVs. Question down here, sir. Sorry, I just <laughs> no. I drive a Highlander, <laughs> but I have a family of. Okay, I'm myself and I live in the beach, and I just like commend you all for doing this. I think it's exactly what we need. That's a two questions slash points and Ms. Kitts and Kit Stint, excuse me, and Keys Matt. I realize this is very political, but everything, all this dialogue and education, I'm happy to hear about the Sun article, but by and large, it's to those that are converted. And the two words of the issue here is Ford Nation. <laughs> I am on every major news media every day. I talk to everybody I can trying to get this dialogue going. I work in the financial industry. Seemingly intelligent people are buying into this Ford Nation. So if this is going in November, I think there needs to be a strategy of real education to these people. Because, you know, Mayor Ford, it's all about campaign slogan, subway, subway, subways, you don't just pay, raise your taxes, someone else is going to pay for it. So I think there needs to be something going to that community and saying, Okay, Mr. Ford, what is the plan? And Ms. Stins, I realize it's very political because I would commend you on your challenge since the mayor, but I want to know, what is the plan? Where are those lines going to go? Obviously, it's subways. Who's going to pay for it? What's the stops? What's the timeline? Challenge them on their beliefs. And then I think you made some great points. $400 to go to a baseball game or to invest in transit. And as an investment, I've actually seriously considered about selling my house and leaving the beach because I don't think it's worth my, the money in 20 years because this city, as someone mentioned at the first meeting, weren't the Russia, the, the Moscow effect. Mm -hmm. I think the livability of the city is going down. So my specific point is, does Mayor Ford have a specific plan? Being on the Transportation Committee, have you seen anything? And I apologize, I know that's political. because I. And secondly, <laughs> please don't preach to the converted get into Ford Nation and challenge them on their beliefs because you've got Dumb and Dumber, as Rosie DeMano calls them, on their, no, I'm in all serious, on their web, on their show every weekend, spewing hatred, saying they respect the taxpayer, but they disrespect anybody who they call in the lefties or the downtown elitists or pinkos. So we need to educate those folks. Yeah, I mean, so, I guess you should I, mean, I don't actually know who Ford Nation is, because Ford Nation has a lot of dimensions to it, although Ford tends to be a one-dimensional fellow, but that, um, that being said, you know, there's, there's, the, there's the group that wants low taxes, efficiency in government that is a legitimate constituency in the city. Then there's the group that, that, um, that does believe that you can build transit and, and subways with no tax increase, and, and you know what? Good for them. Then there's the group that is actually anti-transit, right? Because if you actually stand up and tell people that I'm going to build you subways and I'm not going to raise your taxes and I don't know how I'm going to pay for it, um, you know what you're saying is you don't have any interest in building transit. And so I've asked Ford, where is your plan? And he doesn't have a plan because his plan is to not build transit. That's his plan. 
And so that's the dialogue that you know will come forward. But 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 again, it is, and, and, you know, and that's not a complicated message. <laughs> so, so, but again, as the counselors, and I commend that you know you folks are moving past four trying to silo him. But is there anything that you can do, and a planning can do? And I realize you have to engage the mayor, as difficult as that is. But there must be something that can be done to really challenge that. The, the problem is, is that he's out there. He's got the Toronto Sun and and Tate and or you know and Ten Ten or whatever it is, preaching falsehoods. There needs to be a counterbalance to that that isn't just preaching to they're already converted. So. There have been columnists who've pointed the disconnects out. So they, it's, not, it, it's the willingness of, of people to, you know, it's what they hear. It's not necessarily the information that's there. And uh, that gets into a very deep philosophical question of how you make change and what it takes to create a tipping point. But change does only occur when the climate of opinion changes. Uh, and a lot of things have to feed into that. Some people feel it has to be a burning platform, that there has to be a real crisis. And that other people feel that it's the slow... Uh, you know, that over t things can change over time. I think it's starting to change myself uh, on paying for transit investment. I do think that we're seeing the dial shift. I do. Uh, but, but then I'm short, so I see the glass half full. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name's Lewis, and I'm an accountant, so I'm not going to get anything political today. Um, I just want to make a one comment, one question. Uh, I know that. Uh, Jennifer mentioned that the population will just boom in 2036, so we have lots of people coming in and practically no space. So space is an issue, and Karen makes a point that assets like real estate is a major investment, but have you noticed that also like uh, wherever there's a subway line, those house prices actually increase a lot more when you're near subway lines. And if you look at all the plans that you have, right, uh, most of the uh, lines that is, is being built is on a more kind of richer neighborhood. I'm sorry to say that, but it's kind of true. Um, but actually, but that's not my question. My question is really about uh, Barry, who makes really excellent point, and also uh, Mike as well. And the fact that uh, we are sort of like, for example, I live in Scarborough, and it takes me more time to get to downtown than my coworker lives, lives in Whitby. So the person in Whitby can just Park the car, get the, get the, the go station, go train, mm -hmm. go train, yeah, and get there in 45 minutes. Well, I take them like an hour and 15 minutes, yeah. and like. So, uh, but uh, just just to address some of the concerns that you raised about subways only being built in rich neighborhoods, that is uh, not the case. In fact, with down to extension, because we're going through the Jane and Finch neighborhood, which arguably which is, is really one great. of the most impoverished neighborhoods in our city. Uh, I think um, it was and the job. other, yeah, and the other point I just want to make is that. Um, the majority of the $8.4 billion that's being spent in transit, uh, Scarborough will be the beneficiary of. I understand. So. They always get shafted. <laughs> I'm just joking. Anyway. There's, another, there's another important piece to that. Um, and if you look at the criteria, you'll see that one of the criteria is social equity and the measures that we used related to the relationship between the pros, proposed line and the priority neighborhoods. We have 13 priority neighborhoods, areas that are in significant need. And when you take the criteria in a weighted way, so you look at all the criteria the same, you'll notice that there's a few lines, and Jane LRT is a great example. One of the reasons it scores so high is because it goes through several priority, priority neighborhoods. So the criteria is precisely about ensuring that we're not making transit decisions without, without making those kinds of considerations. But it's also important to know that building the downtown relief line, which you know, Barry so eloquently argued for, it, it might not go through a priority neighborhood, it might not be your neighborhood, but it creates capacity through the whole system. So who benefits from a line isn't necessarily directly linked to the geography of that line because it's a network and it results in a whole variety of different choices and ways to move through the system. Good. By, that's why it's called a relief line. Good point. Question at the back again. I'm sorry I can't see you, but hi. I'm very beautiful, so I'm sorry you missed <laughs> Rodriguez, I'm a taxpayer, and uh, I wouldn't mind to have my taxes raised to have a better transit. As a property owner, we usually are told that you need to invest in your home and repair it and make it reasonably, you know, good, maintain it. Uh, you have to invest three to five percent. So why don't we invest the same in a city? That's just a, a you know, thinking out loud. I wanted to say to Jennifer that maybe 
uh, somebody at Metrolinx could have a similar experience as that uh, Sun reporter. <laughs> I am willing to let them use my wheelchair, which luckily I no longer use, and try to go through the TTC transit system in the city. And maybe they will come up with a couple more other issues in their priority things. Uh, accessibility is not a priority for many areas and maybe you know people don't notice it but for transportation that's vital. I have to assume that the new transit planning will be designed to ensure it has to the be the latest standards the we latest have, standards of we access. We have AODA legislation since 2005 right. which nobody knows much about it but one of the standards is about transportation so I really hope that somehow somewhere uh, it's included because so far I have not heard much about that. I think it's a good reminder, but I believe it is. Yeah, Karen? Just, just to give you comfort, the, uh, one of the uh, primary motivations for the TTC and Council in purchasing the new streetcar fleet was because they're low floor and accessible. And we have a plan to make sure every subway station has an elevator retrofitted by 2025 in order to meet our obligations. Thank you. Barry has a comment and then we're going to go to our questioner over here. I was going to ask the questioner whether she's a provincial taxpayer or a Toronto taxpayer. There seems to be some confusion as to where the money comes from. Um, There's only one taxpayer. <laughs> uh, but this, I, this point of, about tax increases, I think everyone here realizes that Toronto enjoys the lowest residential tax rate in the GTA. We also enjoy the highest appreciation in home and condominium and property values. And, uh, and, and yet we're still thinking we can freeze taxes and, and, and not pay for all the benefits that we're getting at, at no uh, effort on our part because our property values are, are going up. Uh, I, I really think uh, a tax increase is in order. I'm sorry, homeowners, but you've been getting it too good for too long. Hi, my name is Adam Smith. Thanks to the panel. Um, a brief rhetorical point and then, and then a question. Uh, I just read a news release from the city um, about transit funding and infrastructure uh, that we uh, just this past year paid $400 million to service our debt. And uh, this is not you know, something that needs to be answered, but what I'm wondering is why the revenue tools aren't including things like a bank tax, a financial transaction tax, or Councillor Wong Tam's excellent idea of a public bank. So anyways, you guys don't have to address that, I just want to throw it out there. My question though, uh, especially to Mr. Lyons' points, um, you know, I looked at the chart uh, that was in the presentation and you know, you had talked to uh, Ms. Kiesmat about you know, evidence-based decisions, and this to me is not evidence, this is just, you know, people's opinions weighted and added up. Um, and, you know, when it comes to numbers, um, things like the downtown relief line, everyone talks about priority, priority, priority. I know someone who's done a study with all the numbers and stats at the TTC that says, if you ran a, uh, the streetcar, the 504 streetcar from Broadview down as a uh, express streetcar and then service Broadview with buses, there's only a one and a half minute travel time difference between that and the proposed relief line. So I'm just wondering, again, I see all these you know, nicely weighted charts, but these aren't numbers, these aren't evidence-based. I'm just wondering where are the numbers behind some of these projects? And granted, I wish all these projects could happen, um, but I'm just wondering, again, like, you know, where, where is the actual numbers behind this? Never mind opinions, never mind weighted decisions, where's, where's actual hard evidence? Okay, so that's a very important question because remember at the end we're asking you to what extent these, this framework resonates for you. So here's, I think, a, a very important question is in the analysis itself, how much of it is just feeding in opinions, etc., versus actual numbers, and where do the numbers come from? Because Barry's already questioned the ridership projections. So, so Barry and then Jen. Well, remember what, what Barry's speaking about is not a project that's included in our assessment. That's a project that's already approved and moving forward. So okay, but it, our, it, the point that he's making is that uh, the, the ridership projections. Well, no, because oh. uh, based on Barry's analysis, he comes to the same conclusion that our work does, which is the downtown relief line is the number oh. one priority. Okay, so do you want so, to... Use, uh, but, I, but I can answer the question. Um, what you have in there is uh, the top layer of the planning analysis, and in fact, Alan showed in his, his PowerPoint presentation 
the next layer, which is eight, each of those eight criteria have a series of between three and seven specific measures. They're actually things we can measure. We can measure when we place a line, we can measure based on our growth projections what the ridership will be in 2031. That's one specific measure. So each one of those eight has between four and seven measures where we can look at the hard data. We can look at existing population. We can look at amenities. So under healthy neighborhoods, one of the measures was looking at the number of amenities within walking distance of the proposed line. That's we good. can measure that. It's not an opinion. It's an actually quantifiable number. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole layer of data, and then those measures are kind of explained, and there's a rationale. So that chart that I showed you, it actually folds out. And one of the tensions we had in this process was we obviously couldn't <laughs> present that or get into that level of detail, but we can absolutely make that available to you. We can show you all the different measures that we use. So under social equity, we looked at the number of priority neighborhoods that are directly impacted by the placement of a line. Again, you can get a number and you can assess the population that will be impacted and you can also look at the projected population that will be impacted. So each one of those eight looks at the question from a different lens, social equity, supporting growth, public health. So there's a whole, there's a whole series of measures that were created to measure public health and the implication from accessing uh, ravines and parks and the waterfront, for example. In the assessment, what was interesting to us is when we weighted the uh, criteria equally, uh, a, a whole series of really intuitive um, outcomes. And they were based on the data, but they were very intuitive. For example, the downtown relief line is one, one example. There's another layer of analysis, which we're calling strategic fit, that comes once we've gone through this measure, measuring and understanding the priorities, which is then understanding things like the question that you just asked, which is around the um, impact with respect to other infrastructure. And to the comment about kind of nothing, nothing happening, to give you an example, uh, the TTC right now is going through an exercise of signalization automation. And what signalization automation will do, it will allow the trains to run much more frequently, which significantly increases the capacity of the existing infrastructure that we have. So under strategic fit, we look at, okay, well, how will the system be running? And I think it's 2015 when the signalization automation will be complete. Oh, and why does it have to be that long? Because I just came from Paris where they have it. I just came from, uh, like, how come they have it everywhere else and not here? Well, and, and it's behind. actually going to be a little bit later than 2015. Um, so, no, I mean, yeah, it's, um, so, uh, so practically speaking, we have to shut down parts of the system in order to do that work. And so we are going to have to come to the public and actually say we need to shut down the system for 10 days around between St. Andrew and, um, uh, Bloor. Since, uh, since you have University and Avenue, since you have Avenue Road not working, you could shut it all down together. Why would you shut it all down and go away? Yeah. Just, we'll all go away. August, and then say everybody has to leave the city. Everybody has to leave the city. Like they do just respond to but it's being done incrementally. That's my yeah, understanding. Exactly. In order not to disable the whole system, system. parts of it are already complete. Okay. Yeah. So it's being done. There's a work program that's being done in incrementally. Okay, so Barry wants to answer, and then we'll see if that this, gives Adam comfort. This question about the, uh, the downtown relief line, we, sh we shouldn't. In the interest of, of, of tight budgets, we should keep our options open. And I'd like to see a numbers exercise that took that, that idea of not going underground, at least in, in the interim. Maybe coming down, the point is getting siphoning traffic off the Blur Dam for it. So bringing a, a, an LRT or a streetcar down the Broadview, picking up uh, Lever Brothers, picking up uh, the Athletes Village Distillery, uh, cross through Liberty, and um, taking the relief off the king and queen cars. It would be an interesting numbers exercise to take a look at. Uh, we shouldn't close our minds to, uh, to less costly ways if they, in the longer term, it ends up being cost effective. And I just wanted to add one extra point to that is that um, the, the other thing too is you know downtown relief lines all well and good, but the numbers also show that it's the young line, and you guys are adding to you know the young line, and that's where the real volume is coming from, and there doesn't seem to be any real relief in sight for for the biggest.
problem, part of the problem. Oh, there is. We, we so. should extend the DRL up to Eglinton. Absolutely. People are getting on, on the, or coming downtown, yeah. are getting on a northbound train to go to Lawrence so they can get on the bloody train to come south. <laughs> And Lawrence is packed too, because that's where I go. <laughs> okay, so, uh, question or here? Do we have one? Yes? Thanks, um, Adam. Um, I just got, just got, my name is June McDonald. Uh, we just got back from Vancouver, where we did a lot of white biking and cycling. And apart from the infrastructure, which was amazing, the contrast with Toronto, was the drivers. When you crossed the street, they actually saw you and let you go across the street. So you didn't have a feeling that you're going to be a task. And the same with the cycling, too. They're all very relaxed out there. <laughs> <laughs> so how can we give Toronto the same benefit? Um, yeah, there's an entirely different culture here. But the anger is so... That makes cycling unsafe in Toronto, is the anger that we're getting as we bike around. The hostility well, there's no question. is palpable. If you drive down Avenue Road, you're angry. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, is, so, there, is there a question? Because I would like yes, to, I would like to call, is, yeah. if, if drivers in Toronto understood how much they are being subsidized, perhaps they would be a little more charitable towards the cyclists, because the cyclists actually are paying their fair share, but they don't get it. And when you talk about 50,000 people being uh, carried on the... Um, and King Street, nobody talks about how many cars are covered. And I just think that dialogue's not happening, and what can the city do about it? So it's interesting, because I, I do cycle, and, and I also drive. And um, I think for a city that, on many of its streets, doesn't really have a place for cyclists, I, I think the drivers here are, by and large, um, you know, keeping an eye pretty good. And uh, so that I, and we don't have exorbitant accident rates compared to other cities. So I mean, I, I do think that they are good. I mean, there may be one or two. As far as, uh, and the same thing with road rage, I find drivers here are more tolerant than we should be. Because when I look at the level of, I said to Karen before we started, I, Avenue Road has been torn up, you know, like it seems to me three times in five years. And, and that, that, I, that was my impression, it's actually true. And so I said to Karen, could you possibly ask why? She said, I already did. And they explained that it was torn up once and they forgot to put in the pipes. They tore it up again and then they actually planned to tear it up again because you have to wait until it settles to see if there's, you know, to see if the pavement settles down and they put a permanent thing on. There has to be a better way, um, you know, than, than what we're doing. But the drivers are amazingly good. But I just want to link this question back to the proposed uh, bicycle policy framework, which we're, which we're proposing. You'll see it in the kit there. Because part of this is about normalizing cycling as part of our transportation infrastructure. And I think that's a really big part of it. There's still this idea in Toronto that if you cycle, you're a bit of a wingnut. You must be a bike courier or you're kind of edgy, as opposed to it being something that is a normal part of how you move about in the city. And I started cycling when I lived in Vancouver. And in Vancouver, there's a much more gracious kind of approach to cycling as, but Vancouver's has had its battles as well. But also it has it's significant battles. And I think part of the next evolution that we need to go through as a city is putting money towards that infrastructure and recognizing that that infrastructure can actually be a really big part of the solution. So Mike has a comment to answer. I have one brief point to make, and then we're gonna move. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I cycle every day, uh, all winter, all summer, uh, and uh, so I'm sort of part of that, and I have many people look at me like I'm a wingnut. In fact, we're developing a, a kind of infographic about your risk, so people really look at you like, how could you do that? You're absolutely crazy to do that. Uh, and I take the similar routes all the time, it's very predictable, uh, and um, uh, when we actually calculate how people had a year of life, by the way, as opposed to when we look at accidents, it's about five to nine days when we actually add up the math. Uh, and of course that can be better. The second point is, you know, I remember I moved from Montreal to Vancouver and I, I you know, Montreal is the opposite. So if, you, if you're sort of on the sidewalk, they sort of aim for you. Uh, and I remember, you know, just walking to the middle of a street and looking like I was going out and all the cars would stop and it sort of freaked me out in Vancouver. Uh, and, and what's very interesting is looking at different cultures. So when we look at uh, uh, 
uh, the Netherlands, Germany, and, and the Nordic states, there's about a 30% uh, of the population is making the bulk of their under four kilometer uh, movement with cycles. In North America, it's one to two percent. Um, and uh, a huge part of that is driven by Jennifer's decisions and, and a sort of bicycle plan. Uh, um, I, I think uh, a big part of it's changing our culture. So as you say, there's different cultures that it's, it's seen as a higher status thing. And in, in Toronto, they just look at me like I'm poor and crazy. Um, and, and then the other part is just you as an individual. Uh, you'd think I cycle because it's good for my health or, or good for the environment or it's much more predictable about, like much less stressful about getting to me to my downtown meetings um, or, it's, or, or the environment. It, it's none of those things. Uh, when I finish the day cycling, I feel way better. Uh, my health is much, much, uh, my quality of life is much better. And it's, it's a little bit like bags of popcorn, you know, we, 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 we go to movies and we think when we're in this environment that we need to be eating popcorn. So I would always eat the popcorn. And then this bag's, you know, 50 cents or, you know, more than this bag. Uh, but when we actually think about it, we just need this bag. And it costs the popcorn makers one cent to make it this bag. Uh, but, and we feel crappy after we eat that big bag. But we, <laughs> we don't have the kind of self-reflection skills of sort of saying, hey, I don't need to you know, eat that whole bag. I work with a lot of older patients saying, hey, it doesn't have to be a CCM Targa. The bag, bikes now are so much more comfortable and wide and, and all sorts of stuff. There's lots of safe ways to, to get around town. So it's gonna be interesting watching this, you know, how much is planning, how much is our individual mindset, how much is the culture, uh, how much is it seen as a good thing? And also in, in those countries, they don't wear helmets and their, their accident rates are, are much, much less than well, ours. We know a huge part of it is planning because we know that when we put the infrastructure in that we see the cycling increase. And we also know if you go back to the story of Copenhagen, 30 years ago in Copenhagen, no one cycled, very few people cycled and there were some very strategic city planners and Jan Gell was one of them who said, We've just, we're destroying our city and they created a plan to create a cycling culture. It wasn't intuitive, it wasn't something that happened naturally. Mm -hmm. They created a plan, they put in the infrastructure, and they mm -hmm. changed the way people move in the city. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the, other aspect, the other aspect of this is behavioral change, because in the UK, we're running on behalf of the Department for Transport a national bikeability training program. So again, it's getting into that school age safety. Yeah. Yeah. Another quick point on the complete streets. We, also, we call them civilised streets in terms of driver behaviour, people behaviour. I mean, it links to the physical design of complete street, but it's also think civilised street. It's quite a good way of capturing it. That's a good name. Jen, you want me to end this on time because we're seven minutes late. Do you want me to... Mm -hmm. Yeah, we probably should. So how about if I take one more question? And uh, I feel badly because there's still a couple questioners, but I, I, I don't want to... The, the audience was told it would be 8.30 and it's now uh, 8.38, so... One last question, and I don't know who was it. Was it, was it you here, sir? That... Oh, up there on top. You. Okay. <clears throat> um, my name is Julian, and I'm a professional engineer. Um, I have one question for the transporting plan. Because we know what the annually the congestion costs over 6.5 billion, right? And the, in that congestion, there's a part of congestion in the 401 highway. And the, the congestion in the highway 401 is partially caused by the, the highway toll on 407, right? My question is, um, did anybody calculate what is the toll on uh, highway 407, the congestion caused in the 401? Has anybody calculated the... Yeah. Did you get the rest of the question? No, the, the cost of... Has anybody calculated how the 407 relieved 401 of congestion? Yeah, the, but my question is actually is... Has anybody calculated the economic the benefits? The cost of the highway room 401 caused the congestion in highway, four, or highway 407, caused congestion in highway 401, right? Jen, short answer, Jen. Well, the catch...